Calling the committee to order. I'm missing some committee members. I hope everybody can hear me. Here we come, okay. So um, first order of business is roll call. Teresa Taylor. Here. Dana Hollinger. Here. Rob Fechner. Here. Adria Jenkins-Jones. Here. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma. Here. Mona Pasquil Rogers. Here. Teresa Taylor. Oh, sorry. You already got me. Yeah, I got her. All right. She, she does. Yeah. Sorry, I think she forgot that the last time, did she? Yeah, okay, my bad. Um, uh, next order of business is the approval of the two th uh, today's timed agenda. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. All right. All right, I have a motion to approve by, approve by Dana Hollinger. I think it was a second from Bill Slayton. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All those opposed? I got an abstain from uh, Mr. Fechner. All right. Next order of business, executive report. Mr. Hoffner. Good afternoon, Doug Hoffner, CalPERS team member. I want to congratulate both the chair and the vice chair and the members of the committee. Looking forward to working with all of you this year. Um, today we have two items before you today. First is the, um, the semi-annual approval of the major report for the CEO. You heard about that in closed session. That will be coming up in a second. And the second is an item of, in more detail related to the compensation pay structure we discussed in December that the committee at that time asked us to bring back greater detail on several uh, recommendations. We're doing that today related to the investment management positions and pay philosophy. Um, <clears throat> and that will be a follow-up in, in more in-depth conversation. Uh, Tina Campbell, the chair, or chair, the um, human resources director will uh, help present that with uh, Grant Thornton, the board's independent um, performance and compensation talent management committee consultants. We also have Andrew Junkin with Wilshire Consulting here to help. Um, if there's any questions you want to ask him related to um, what he's seen in the marketplace as well. With that, uh, that concludes my report. All right, thank you. All right. So then I guess we're going to move on to the action consent item, approval of the 12-18-18 open session meeting minutes and review of the performance compensation and talent management committee delegation. Do I have a motion for approval? Second. Moved by S Slayton and second by Hollinger. All those in favor of uh, motion for approval, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right. Um, motion carries. We're moving on to item seven, information consent items. I didn't have any request to pull anything off. So now we are moving on to the action agenda items. And that is the semi-annual status report on the incentive plan of the CEO. And Tina, I guess you were gonna introduce the item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Tina Campbell, CalPERS team. The delegation resolution, oh, I'm sorry. I have the wrong one. Um, so this one is just for open. So as you heard um, earlier in closed session, um, we have the CEO's um, semi-annual status report. And um, just for members that are new to the board, um, the board's compensation policy of executive investment management positions requires the CEO to prepare semi-annual status reports on her incentive plan for the performance compensation and talent management committee's review and approval. These reports provide a means of informing the committee on progress toward achieving the measures in the incentive plan presented in attachment one, which you all should have a copy of, provided as a handout to the committee is a semi-annual status report for the CEO covering the time period of July 1st to December 31st, 2018. Um, as mentioned earlier, this was also provided in closed session for your consideration and uh, approval. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Ms. Frost for any updates that she may wanna provide you or any questions that you may have. All right, thank you. Ms. Frost. Thank you. Um, I covered my update in closed session, so I would still remain available to answer any questions that you may have. All right. Seeing no questions from the committee, I guess we will move on. So now we are on. So that, that was an action item for a vote. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. 
It is an action item. So um, I need a motion to move this um, move approval by Rob Fechner. Second. We have a tie for second. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will pick Mona. <laughs> uh, so all those in favor of mo um, approving the action item 8A semi-annual status report on incentive plan of the CEO, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, seeing, hearing no opposed, motion carries. And then we, I'm sorry, we will move on to action item 8B, salary and incentive options for investment management positions. And Ms. Campbell, if you wouldn't mind introducing the team of Grant Thornton for us. Sure. Um, today, uh, Tina Campbell, CalPERS team member. Today we have with us Grant Thornton, Eric Gonzaga, and Eric Mishka. Uh, item 8B is also an action item, presenting salary and incentive data for investment management positions covered by the board's compensation setting authority under government code section 20098. In December of 2018, the board's primary compensation consultant, Eric Gonzaga of Grant Thornton, presented a pay philosophy with three options that would position combined salary plus incentive for all investment management positions around the 50th percentile of the market. The, com the committee requested that Mr. Gonzaga return with data for two of the three options, which he and his colleague, Eric Mishka, are here to present today. Before I turn it over to them for the presentation, I'd like to highlight a few key points. The main purpose of today's presentation is for the committee to understand the structure, components, and costs associated with each option, as well as to discuss benefits and other potential considerations. Based on the committee's review and discussion, the recommendation is for the committee to select one of the options for implementation in fiscal year 2019-20. With the exception of any decisions on the COIO position, which are recommended to become effective immediately for recruit recruitment purposes as that position is vacant. This decision to align investment management salaries with the market median will support CalPERS ability to recruit and retain highly qualified investment talent in order to gain the best returns for our members. Competitive compensation levels for these positions have been discussed by the committee over the last few years, beginning with a comparator group salary survey that was conducted by McLaughlin and presented to the board in 2015. The data being presented today is derived from that survey with some conservative adjustments made to more closely reflect today's market. In 2016, the board engaged Grant Thornton to conduct a comprehensive review of CalPERS compensation programs. Grant Thornton concluded total cash compensation levels were positioned well below the competitive market and proposed recommendations to address lagging compensation levels. I'd like to emphasize that decisions today are not intended to provide for immediate compensation increases for current incumbents in these positions. Once a decision is made, CalPERS team members and Grant Thornton will work on a detailed implementation plan which will include an approach and timeline to appropriately place current incumbents into the revised salary ranges and their current salary falls below the new minimum selected today. The CalPERS team and Grant Thornton will return at a future meeting to discuss the implementation plan and provide all relevant details including the impacts to the board's compensation policy for executive and investment management positions. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Gonzaga and Mr. Mishka for the presentation and discussion. All right, thank you. Thanks, and, uh, Thanks, and um, you know, certainly happy to be back here to uh, bring you some more detail. What we're going to go over in um, you know the presentation is um, you know fairly straightforward in that what we're really focused in on here is how do we get to a competitive level of pay for the investment office positions and it's based on the custom peers historically relied upon over the last several years and uh, you know what we'll cover today is. You know, a couple things. First is a reminder of, uh, you know, the strategies uh, that we decided upon pursuing, uh, you know, at the last board meeting, uh, the last committee meeting in terms of option A and option C. Uh, a little more color on what that would look like. And ultimately also taking a look at the numbers and the data uh, position by position. So, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, you take a look at, uh, you know, the presentation. What we wanted to, you know, first of all, what we're starting out at is a philosophy. What are we targeting? How to get to competitive total cash compensation. So that's 50th percentile total cash compensation in the peer group. 
And we, we came up with two different strategies. One was higher salaries and lower annual incentives. Secondarily, it was a combination of uh, you know, moderate increases to the salary structure, uh, annual incentives similar to a little bit lower than current levels, and as opposed to uh, increasing salaries significantly, what we would do is a lot adopt a long-term incentive that would reward based on performance of the fund overall. Those were the two options discussed. And, you know, what I should say just, uh, you know, before we get to the data is that these still represent, uh, you know, a discount relative to the competitive market because we're targeting something that we believe is fair which is 50th percentile total cash compensation, but it's not 50th percentile total direct compensation because, again, a reminder that many of the peers offer things such as supplemental deferred compensation or long-term incentives. This is, again, focused on moving the overall pay program for CalPERS professionals to average middle-of-the-market positioning for total cash only, which is still uh, a moderate discount for market practices. Now. In terms of background for option A and option C, what we're trying to do here, again, is get to 50th percentile total cash compensation. We're still trying to strike a balance, however, between uh, you know, the mission of this very unique organization, alignment uh, in terms of pay with performance, uh, considerations of risk management, as well as uh, you know, recruitment and retention in terms of the candidates that we're trying to bring in uh, uh, you know, going forward. So option A is really one that we've talked about before. And what that would do is position salaries towards the top end of the market, okay? That would also result in a de decrease in annual incentive opportunities uh, for some and no long-term incentives. So again, we'd, we'd talk about higher salaries. Folks would move into appropriate positioning uh, and uh, be rewarded from a pay for performance standpoint, both from a salary increase standpoint and in addition to uh, you know, modest annual incentive payouts. This, uh, uh, this strategy, it has the advantage of uh, you know, what we always talk about is when you think about investment management and in, in investment incentives, certainly competitive pay gets you to about that 50th percentile total cash level, but there's not as much leverage on, from an only annual incentive standpoint, which of course you always worry about risk management, are we making short-term decisions, et cetera. So it balances those two things, and you know, certainly the salary becomes kind of that staple feature with which you recruit, you retain from, because it's a very highly competitive salary, albeit again, talking about average positioning for total cash, not total direct, again, uh, competitive enough. Option C is uh, same levels of competitiveness in terms of uh, total cash compensation, average total cash positioning, same cost associated with it. It would require increasing salary range midpoints to anywhere from the 50th to the 75th percentile, similar to some decisions that have been made in the past. Maintain or slightly increase the current annual incentives. And ultimately provide a long-term incentive strategy in a long-term incentive plan that rewards and pays out based on three to five year performance. But the long-term incentive opportunities would be comparable to the annual incentives. And the whole point of that is just to make sure if we're going to recognize pay, per, pay for performance, it incentivizes uh, making decisions both in terms of maximizing return on an annual basis or performance uh, on an annual basis without sacrificing decisions for the long term and ultimately uh, long-term investment decisions, long-term performance would be rewarded for say anywhere from a three to five year performance period. So it's a nice balanced portfolio. Option A is just higher fixed pay, lower annual incentives. Option C is a more balanced portfolio. Still gets you to the same number, but it optimizes return uh, and, and maximizes incentive based on long-term performance. Both have uh, you know, comparable recruitment and retention value and get you closer to uh, market for the industry peers which you selected. Any questions on that? Doesn't look like it so far. Okay. Now, on the long-term incentive plan side, because uh, certainly this isn't a finished product, but how does a long-term incentive plan work? If you were to uh, uh, choose option C, which is the one that uh, has the long-term incentive plan, 
you'd have opportunities that are comparable in terms of annual incentives and long-term incentives. For example, if you have a 40% opportunity on the annual incentive plan side, you would have a 40% of salary opportunity on the long-term incentive plan side. Again, the whole point of that is to make sure that we're making and the incentive structure is such that there's a, a balanced portfolio in terms of what are we focused in on. We don't want to maximize short-term returns at, at, to the detriment of long-term performance. It also optimizes retention because you're delaying payouts for a period of years, and you have to earn that performance over a period of years. And, you know, our, our thought being, and again, uh, uh, an idea that we floated with you before, is that the long-term incentive plan uh, would align with total fund performance on an absolute return basis. It provides alignment with, uh, a, a, you know, preservation and increasing the value of the fund such that uh, it, it ensures focus on maximizing uh, you know, the value of the pensions in place. So strong alignment with, uh, you know, the pension holders, so to speak. So if you select option C, certainly there's some other things to, uh, you know, flesh out along the plan. Very basic structure focused on total fund performance. There's always other criteria you can throw in there. But uh, it, it also provides an appropriate balance with what's incentivized through the annual uh, incentive plan. So any questions before we turn over to the numbers? Yes, I have one question from the committee so far. Lynn? Oh, there you are. Oh, thank you. Um, so I had a question when you were discussing the absolute fund performance. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Are you suggesting that there would be some kind of a return target? So regardless of what the benchmark returns were, it would be based on that one, hitting that one number? Yes, it, it, it's part of the fund because, um, you know, as part of the annual incentive fund, uh, relative return is uh, included in terms of, uh, you know, annual incentive, the annual incentive plan. And there would be a linkage between uh, the annual incentive plan and the long-term incentive plan in that, um, you know, whatever is paid out from a long-term incentive plan standpoint would go up or down based on overall return. So it's just a nice counterbalance between absolute return and, and uh, relative returns. Uh, you know, so it's, it's more of that balanced incentive portfolio where there's alignment with both. In addition, it says that, you know what, we're going to pay out uh, to the extent that essentially what it comes down to is does, it, does the funding of the pension plan increase, so to speak. So, so are you suggesting it would be based on funded status or on returns? Returns. Okay. Uh, returns. All right. So. Thank you. Um, I just have a follow-up on that. Are you, so are you, you didn't really, I wasn't clear that you answered, are you benchmarking that? Like, we have to hit our benchmark and then the long-term incentive or, or kicks in or how, how is, how are you envisioning that, envisioning right. that? Well, it, it really comes down to what, you know, just like with the annual incentive plan, you benchmark yourself against relative returns. You pick, you pick a point and, and you pay out threshold target, outstanding dollar amounts. Same thing with uh, the absolute return where, where, where you'd pick a, um, and there's some details that would have to be, uh, you know, fleshed out, but certainly, uh, you know, the, the, the amount would go up or down based on how you achieve certain absolute return targets. So. Okay, so... So you are hashing it out, <coughs> and it may be a benchmark, but it'll, it'll have different uh, components to it. That's right. Uh, you know, just just no different than any other the annual incentive plan goals. Typically, you define performance levels in terms of hey, for a modest award, we have to reach X benchmark. For a target award, we reach Y benchmark. For a maximum award, we we achieve Z benchmark. Same thing with uh, you know the absolute return mechanism. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think you can go on. Excuse me. All right. Oh, Bill, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what? You're not appearing system. on my screen. Well. I mean, I you so. are, but you're already turned on, and I didn't touch it. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me just <clears throat> let's go over this one more time, just before you get to the numbers, to make sure uh, that we all are on the same page. <clears throat> so, right now we have an annual incentive that is tied to performance against benchmarks. That's right. So, therefore, someone can receive additional compensation even if the fund is negative, correct? That's right. Right. Okay. So, 
What this does, the long-term incentive being tied to absolute returns, balances against that one that's done against the benchmark <clears throat> that says at the end of the day, on a long-term basis, we're trying to grow this fund. So that creates, in, in my mind, correct me, if, if you, see if you feel the same way, that it, correct, it creates another tranche of alignment that aligns with what we're all trying to do, which is have the fund grow to accommodate the payouts that have to occur. That Absolutely, and, okay. and uh, it, it is intended to be kind of uh, that final piece that matches up the compensation program with the mission of the organization, which is to say that you will receive these awards to the extent that... Uh, that we all uh, benefit. Yep, there's more money to pay the pensions is another simple way to put it. So. Gotcha. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, go ahead. All right, um, moving on to the recommended uh, pay levels. We'll have a slide for each kind of position in the um, investment office. And so I want to walk through kind of what's, what's on this page, and then we'll go through. So if there's any questions on this, you know, let us know now, because um, every page after this will look very similar to this one. Um, but we've got a bar graph here showing, on the left-hand side, um, CalPERS today. Um, so you can see the midpoint of the CalPERS range plus target incentive bonus on the far left-hand side, um, totaling up to about $171,000. Next to that is if you look at the, the highest level of the, the salary range plus the highest um, bonus target or maximum bonus opportunity that somebody in that role can earn, um, totaling up to $227,000. Um, that range, incentive range today is zero to 40% with a 27% target. And now what we're gonna be showing is op our option A and option C that <clears throat> Eric just went through in terms of kind of moving these pay levels to the market median of total cash. And those, the market data is going to be shown on the lines. Uh, so you've got a dotted line showing the 25th percentile, a solid line showing the market median 50th percentile, and then the, the top dotted line showing the market 75th percentile. Um, as, as we discussed before, option A and option C in terms of total dollars are very similar. Um, our goal is to move um, the associate investment manager salary range to a midpoint of $204,000 uh, $204, with a $29,000 um, incentive opportunity under option A, totaling $233,000 with a maximum total cash payout um, potential of $309,000 under option A. Similar concept, similar dollars in option C, it's just that we're now a um, little bit less in salary and that additional amount then would be placed in the long-term incentive pool. Any questions on, on this graph? Um, so I, I just had a question, and I noticed this as I was going through this the other day. It appears that option A doesn't always, but sometimes ends up higher than option C, where we're giving that extra bonus structure, because they start a little higher, I guess, for their range, or for their, their base salary. Right. Correct? Correct, yeah. Um, so I find that interesting because that's not the case with all of these. So I don't know how that's figured differently. Well, yeah, what we're, what we're trying to show is kind of move the salaries um, to a level that is you know, with the market. So in the, an option A, it was getting the salaries um, to be at the higher end of the market and then kind of piecing on the incentive piece on top of that. Um, and some of these into positions, um, some of the data and the way the bonus opportunities are for it to make um, you know, sense from a you know implementation standpoint, you know, the numbers are gonna be slightly different depending on you know the bonus opportunity and the salary range to be competitive. Um, we didn't back into the number, let's say, but we instead we try to come up with a competitive salary and then add on the incentive piece. So that's why you might see some slight differences between option A and C and as we go through the different positions. Okay. All right, thank you. Go go ahead. Okay. I don't think oh I'm sorry, Mr. Jones. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, looking at the maximum on both A and C option, <clears throat> they both almost get to the same point. Uh, my question is, which of these options, and it's relative to the others that we're going to review too, it's the same type of question, which one of these options do you believe attract and retain the employees to the greatest degree? 
so in, in, in it is going to depend on um, you know the type of uh, uh, you know candidate you're recruiting and how how many would prefer higher base salary over more leverage now I do think that um, you know option a if uh, if I were to think about it um, I think that certain individuals certainly would be more attracted to uh, you know, higher salary because you're really talking about fixed pay at, uh, say, the 90th percentile. Even though the dollars are the same, uh, you know, there, there, there is an advantage in terms of recruiting folks with higher fixed pay. So from a recruitment standpoint, I think, uh, you know, option A has a slight advantage. Now, ultimately, uh, you know, it, it, it could come out, uh, it, it comes out as a wash in the numbers. I think that if somebody's purely... Uh, you know, depending on the, the, the type of candidate, option C may be more attractive to certain individuals in that uh, there's different ways to kind of increase that pay for performance alignment. You could add more long-term incentive, upside, et cetera. Uh, so I, I do think I would say from a recruitment standpoint, option A may have uh, a, a little bit more uh, advantage in terms of recruitment, but at the same time, we're talking about the same dollars and ultimately, uh, what I would say is that what we want to do, what, what, what my preference would be, is to come up with a balanced portfolio and align pay with the performance of the organization. And so even though option A, from my perspective, may have a little bit more advantage in terms of recruitment, option C aligns a little bit better with the, uh, aligns better with the mission because of the long-term pay for performance <coughs> component. And if you're recruiting individuals from um, the private industry, they're going to be familiar with and have this long-term incentive portfolio as well. So it won't be a, a new, it won't be new to them. Be Would you say that again? I didn't quite understand. If you're, if you're recruiting folks from private industry, they're going to be familiar with the long-term incentive concept. Mm -hmm. and that's not going to be new to them. Thank you. <coughs> Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, I think the the issue it, it's both recruitment okay. and alignment, mm -hmm. and the problem I have with A is that it, it tends to exacerbate the misalignment uh, with because you're not considering absolute performance. And absolute performance drives the funding level. All sorts of things get driven by that at this organization, and yet A kind of ignores that piece of it in a certain sense. What I'd like to ha make sure that we do, I don't know whether this is the appropriate <laughs> time to have uh, uh, Andrew Junkin uh, kind of chime in on this from the standpoint of these two different designs and uh, what his opinion is seeing it from uh, from a different perspective as well. So, um, Mr. Hoffner, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to maybe uh, refresh uh, the committee's memory related to our general purpose overall statement in the board's incentive comp policy, which really talks about this very issue. And we did make some modifications a couple months ago, I think at the end of last year, which basically talks about really the purpose of having compensation policy with this kind of structure is to encourage highly qualified individuals to accept and remain in positions, but not so high as to attract candidates solely for the compensation. And I think to Mr. Slayton's point, you only get, you get that, we're trying to get there. I mean, we're still saying this is median, it's kind of the target, which is what you asked for data from December, but it's that alignment of interest, really. What, how are we gonna grow the total fund and how do the individuals who participate um, at least on the investment side, as it translate in that long-term incentive as we're a long-term investor. So I think it's an alignment of interest as well. Um, happy to have um, Andrew come up and, and give his perspective as well, but it is something called out in our you know, overall policy as well. Right, and I remember we did talk about that. Did you still want to have Andrew come up? Well, I think uh, I, I, I would, he, I'd like to hear from him if he's willing to make sure. some comments on this subject. Good afternoon, Andrew Junkin, Wilshire Consulting. Um, I think your question is, do I have a preference for A over C? I have, you've seen me typing away. I've been putting yeah. my comments into some form here. Um, <clears throat> our view is that the long-term incentive plan is comparable to equity ownership, um, which as you'll recall from our annual reviews of the global equity program, the global fixed income program is a place where we sort of ding CalPERS in that scoring process every year. So it would be inconsistent of us I think, to say that we support A over C. After saying that. After saying that. So no mm -hmm. surprise, you, you, we support C over A. But 
the devil is in the details, and I know we haven't gotten fully to all of the details yet, but, but some of this discussion about long-term incentive, if I may, I'd just like to make a few additional comments sure. on. Um, <clears throat> being based on absolute return only may have some unintended consequences, right? And, and, and that's really what we're trying to, to manage anytime you design an incentive program is what are we actually rewarding and what's, what are the unintended consequences? So as we talked about yesterday during the performance review, 83% of CalPERS portfolio risk is driven by the, the stock market, right? And so the market is down meaningfully in one year. You could wipe out long-term incentive for five years, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going to be baked into a five-year number for five years. And so that, that would be a challenge. So does that then disincentivize people? Does that create turnover, which is what you're seeking to avoid? Um, there, there is a, um, and, and does it sort of concentrate the turnover? There, there's an example, a competitor of ours had a um, uh, equity ownership plan with look back on pricing. Uh, and so there were a number of senior people at the firm that had large equity ownership positions uh, through like June of 2009, they could look back to the July of 2008 stock price and when they left, they could get that stock price. Well, think of what happened to an asset management firm's revenues and profits. There was a mass exodus at the senior level and suddenly this firm is, I mean, it created lots of opportunities for people to move up, but they had significant turnover at the senior level. Um, I think overall what you really, what I would like to see of any incentive plan, and this is something that we've, we've I've just revised the incentive plan within Wilshire Consulting, so it's kind of fresh on my mind, is the ability to distinguish between top performers and middle performers and bottom performers. And if everybody's tied to the same metric, that becomes somewhat challenging. I mean, you've got components where people are going to make fair wages, certainly. Um, but the way that we did that, I sort of um, delinked some things that were explicitly just tied to a common factor for everybody, which happened to be revenue, and uh, created some discretionary, more discretion in the system so that I could actually differentiate between top, middle, bottom performers. Um, in terms of, and, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of bouncing around. Um, in terms of what do we see in the market, incentive compensation is overwhelmingly the common strategy in the asset management business. It would be strange to have either a small amount or n nothing at risk. Um, it's not uncommon to see, you know, at an, at an expected comp level 50-50, maybe even more towards the bonus. That's not at all uncommon. Um, but the, the risk is that no matter what you do, people feel entitled to the target number that you throw out there. Um, and so if, you, you know, even if there's a, a, um, a bad year, Every business has them. Every you know, investor would have them. They still feel like they should get that target number. So that's tough to manage. Um, I, I'll stop there. I've, I've jotted a few more notes okay. down, but I'll save those. For well, I, I think you've raised some very key points. Uh, you know, I come out of an industry that was twenty percent base comp, eighty percent uh, variable comp, wow. uh, based on performance. So, I. I get that, and I think the industry does. It may not be as radical as the industry I came from, but it's it's in that genre. And uh, so I think that I would suggest, and we need to go through the rest of the numbers, that we separate the issue of long-term from plan design, because you've raised some issues. I think that our tendency is to take the simple over the effective, and if we just say it's it's nothing but absolute return, and that's it, and that's the parameter. I'm not sure we're getting the most creativity into plan design by restricting it to that. I think that we, we have people who are very creative here and who can figure out a plan design and bring it back to us that has, uh, that's fleshed out and that, again, 
avoids the unintended consequences, but yet creates a fair system that gets us this, on the same page, uh, moving to the same objective. So I would suggest that the first decision is the A versus C, do we want a long-term incentive? And then uh, I would encourage some further plan design work on the long-term portion of it so that we come up with a, the best design. Yeah, and I just uh, I'd, I'd voice that uh, that's certainly what uh, th that's consistent with our thoughts. I mean, there is no perfect plan design. Ultimately, a long-term incentive plan. It's a management system. It's a management process. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, absolute and fund performance can be a part of it, but uh, ultimately, it needs to be customized. So, all right, Ms. Hollinger, hold on, I didn't get you. There you go. Thank you. Um, coming from an industry where you kind of eat what you kill, oh, I'm the total opposite. But um, what I've also noticed in those kind of conditions that um, people sometimes, that doesn't always drive appropriate behavior. So that's a risk in and of itself. Um, at this juncture, I would be interested, um, Ben, in hearing your input because I, am I allowed? No. I don't know that we're... Oh, we can't. Uh, yeah, no. Oh, because it's, it's their conflict. Yeah. Well, I'm, I guess I'm wondering if my fellow board members, like, um, if we did increase our allocation to more illiquid asset classes um, that might not have valuation, I, I'm wondering if... if uh, again, I think I'm thinking maybe more of a hybrid, and, and I guess why I'm thinking that is um, maybe we're going to be. Uh, I always want to make sure we're compensating people for taking risk off the table when it's appropriate. So. Uh, you know, I just say that um, uh, you know Andrew raised uh, a, a very important issue, and it's also something that we dealt with, uh, you know, from the standpoint of the annual incentive plan. And it, it really is risk management is an important piece. Part of that is the structure of the goals and the structure of the plan itself. The other part is uh, the use of discretion, and uh, that is something that will always play. Uh, a big role in any sort of asset manager plan, and, and certainly it's something that uh, we've emphasized as part of uh, the annual incentive plan, so it would just carry forward. Risk management has to be part of it, so. So I just wanted to, um, Andrew, you had said that um, you don't want unintended consequences. So for example, if a 2008 occurs, then uh, we got five years of baked in numbers and there's no long-term incentive for the five-year period. But on the other hand, I think you were talking about, uh, um, I can't, what were you saying that would be in place of that then? If, I mean, I, I wrote yeah, down that delineated was, that was revenue. The, that was the part I left out. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I, I have some suggestions, but I don't know that they're, I mean, I, I I'm sort of springing this on Eric, so I apologize for that. But, um, you know, could there be a, a, a bonus pool that's generated um, based on total fund relative performance? Total fund relative performance is already in the, for lack of a better phrase, the, the short-term incentive. But it's also mixed with, currently, it's mixed with asset class performance. So maybe... The long-term plan is total fund only, which really aligns everybody's interests. Um, and But to the discretion point, maybe that bonus pool then is allocated, and I don't, I'm going to say things that I have no knowledge about, so if somebody throws something at me and says that's inappropriate, then that's, that's fine. But, you know, maybe it in a private corporation, it might be allocated then by the CIO to the heads of the asset classes to distribute within the asset classes based on individual performance. I don't know that we have that authority. So that's, there's some discretion there. Again, I don't know if that works under under the construct of California. Right. Um, but I think, and then, and then maybe you even go further, and here's a place where you can actually tie back in the, the absolute return. Let's say 
an individual earns a $20,000 grant into this deferred pool, over the next five years, maybe that grows or shrinks based on the performance of the total fund at that point, right? So it's earned based on total fund relative, but then it, uh, it changes in value. Now, admittedly, some of that is equity markets go up more often than they go down. So you're probably baking in, in most cases, an increase in the, the deferral award over a period of time. But I think that's pretty common. Okay, so there's lots of creative ways, Eric, I think is what he's saying. Yeah, and, and, and actually that last point is something that uh, we've considered very strongly. It's actually consistent with what we outlined in 2016. Uh, Those when are we kind first... of what our peers are doing. Yeah, and, and it's also something that we outlined in two th 2016 as the general design construct. So I'm sure that Andrew and I are aligned in, in, in thinking. There's a whole array of ways to do it, and I think that uh, the biggest issue, as Mr. Slayton indicated, is uh, do we want a long-term incentive plan? And, and again, I mean, our bias also is towards C in terms of alignment with mission. Uh, taking out the recruitment retention piece, it's the best uh, balanced way to go about doing things. And so, uh, you know, I think our, 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 uh, our primary uh, initiative here is that we, 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 we feel strongly, one, that you should move to the 50th percentile. That's, that's a fair wage. And uh, that uh, you should base it on alignment with mission. And, and again, I feel strongly that option C is probably that, uh, that, that better uh, alignment piece. So. So I had a couple of questions um, on, because I don't have anybody else asking questions right now. So lucky you. <laughs> on the, uh, I'm going through the numbers again uh, for each, you know, classification. Investment manager, associate investment manager. All of a sudden, from investment, associate investment manager, you have CalPERS today, option A, option C. And then investment manager, all of a sudden you have CalPERS range A, B, C, option A and C. Is that because the range, uh, each of the ranges are already there? And so, so now we're just taking away those ranges? Is that what we're doing? We're taking away ranges? Yeah, so right okay. now uh, under CalPERS, there are three you know, ranges within the investment manager role. And we're, we're recommending collapsing that into one. Um, so we'll have, still have option A and option C under our proposed <laughs> suggestions here, um, but combining the three ranges that CalPERS has currently into one range for the investment manager role. Um, okay, so The difference between the three today, as I understand it, is the, the rate difference in um, incentive targets. Yeah, um, there's very little difference otherwise yeah. in their actual salary. Right. It's the same salary. Correct. Okay. Okay, that's where I was uh, a little confused. And I just wanted to remind everybody we've been talking about this long-term incentive for a while. Um, as long as we iron out the, the particulars and it, and it fits for our employees, I think it's, it's important that we move on this. Go ahead, Doug. Some, uh, Madam Chair, so we do have within the policy a discretionary performance adjustment section, and so I just want to read a little bit of that because I think while this doesn't envision the long-term incentive in the current policy, it does speak to um, what can be exercised today, and I think that might be helpful as this overall discussion goes forward. It says, basically, an award can be adjusted upward by any percentage based on qualitative individual contributions. Discretionary adjustments may not exceed the maximum incentive opportunity, so that to that point of going upwards. Um, it also has the points about an award may be adjusted downward by any percentage or eliminated together altogether based on unsatisfactory individual performance. So it's trying to tease apart um, the rising of all these votes based upon one target at the same time looking at individual. And then it, and then I think to, to Ms. Hollinger's point, it talks about the non-adherence of CalPERS risk management principles, policies, processes, and procedures. An award can be reduced or e by either 50% or eliminated entirely based on the severity of non-adherence. So this is baked in today, and I think the question is as we build out whichever direction the board goes, we can take some of these principles and apply them to the long-term piece as well, because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a discretionary piece about how that would be built out today, but and this, this aligns for these investment management positions with, with Ben as the CIO and the way the policies um, with concurrence of the CEO. So it is here, um, and I think it's something we just need to maybe uh, further discuss and, and as we go forward as how that would be implemented, but, but these, do, these do apply today. So let me it's ask a question. Other than managed, yes. We're, we are supposed to take an action on this item. What does that mean going forward if we're supposed to take an action? Are we saying go ahead and come back with more constructs? 
Is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah. So because I think we it, haven't finalized it, so I'm a little confused. No, no. I think, it, I think based upon the request to bring sets of data back is, are you comfortable with the, the pay philosophy should get to the median? And basically told us in December, yes, but not didn't know what the data looked like because that was consistent with the prior discussions for both um, the CFO and uh, the CIO most recently changed um, in 2018. I think the question is, how do we get there? And you've got one under option A, which essentially takes it a higher base pay salary, which drives pensionable compensation for some and not others. There's importation questions there. I don't know that it has the alignment that we've been discussing in terms of long-term investor. And C basically kind of teases that out. Um, and it's still something you have to earn. So while it's getting you to the 50th uh, percentile, um, there's still opportunity for it to go up or down. And I think really that's the, the driver of alignment that we're that I think I've been, we've been working on this for a couple of years that really have been driving towards is how do we get that alignment so it's not how any one individual does is how the collective organization does and aligns to meeting the mission of this organization. So we're picking, so what we're doing in this action item is picking A or C. That Correct. That is what we're, we're doing. Okay, because it doesn't actually say that. So I'm a little concerned uh, that it doesn't say that. It just says revised pay ranges and incentive award ranges for investment management positions. So we're not actually telling you that we accept range or I think that would be the motion if that's at some point in time that would be a discussion. If well, that's what I, you ahead, I would suggest. And then I got Adria after you. Okay. I, I would suggest maybe it's, an, it's a two-step process. One is uh, do, we, do we accept the concept of C that includes a long-range incentive? I think that's the first one. The second one is, and I don't know if it's appropriate if you want this instruction today, for us to go through the cost and then see if we are comfortable with the ranges in C for these positions. The design of the detail of the long-term incentive would be, I would view that as a task for staff to work on with consultants and come back to us with that design. So I think that's the same thing, though. I think if we're comfortable with the ranges, we're saying yes to C. No, no. I, I, so well, we don't need to take a vote on both. Uh, okay, we can I combine think, them. See yeah. with these ranges is yeah. fine, but then the de the plan design. There's still detail work to be done on the long-term incentive portion of the plan okay. itself. So if 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 you're okay to entertain a motion, I would put a motion on the floor. Okay, you want to give me some verbiage for that? <laughs> uh, uh, sure. That uh, uh, I need to get to Adria first before oh, I get I'm to sorry. the motion. Go ahead. Well, first, first of all, thank you. I think we need to look at this a, a little bit more. She started off the presentation talking about re, uh, recruitment and retention, and I personally don't believe that we have enough information. When December, I asked to get down to some granular detail about recruitment and retention, and that had not been presented at all. So I okay. had Cal HR pull the numbers, okay? So, um, if you look at their voluntary separation rate over the last three years, it's at 3.8 percent, okay? Also, the vacancy rate for investment managers averages, which is about 13 percent over a three-year period, which is the state average, which is between 13 and 14 percent. So I have a hard time believing, first of all, that we have a recruitment and retention issue. Are you also, I'm sorry. Just could you tell me what was that classification again? Um, that's the, the group, all the classifications. This is the average of all the, class the ones we're looking classifications. The right classifications. Okay. However, during the same period, there's a 17.4% vacancy rate for CalPERS investment officers, which is the rank and file. So while we give them more salary, we're creating a, a, a bigger gap between rank and file and supervisory. Um, and when you look at all the appointments that have been made at CalPERS over the last three years, 80% of those appointments into the investment management classification come from people that already work for CalPERS. So how can that even be an argument that there's a recruitment and retention issue for this classification? If you look at all the job postings that they've done over the last from 2016, 2017, and the first half of 2018, on average, they receive 31 applications for every position, and they have at least 77 people on a cert list every time they pull a cert. 
So there's a lot of other information and details that I feel that we need to be looking at before we start saying, oh, we're gonna go with C, oh, we're gonna go with A. If we go with the 50th percentile of each classification, basically we're getting ready to approve a salary increase arranging from 42 to 100%. The associate investment manager starts off at $171,000, 50th percentile puts it at $243,000. The investment manager, $240,000, 50th percentile puts it at $426,000, which is 78% increase. So as we do this, we're creating a definite gap between rank and file and supervisory. At minimum, rank and file, the gap is like 28%. So and I, I need just to talk want after work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, uh, I, I appreciate that, Ms. Jenkins Jones. Um, as a rank and file employee, I uh, understand that. Uh, unfortunately, I, um, I think that's something that has to be taken up elsewhere, rank and file. Um, I agree. We're creating a, a, another wealth gap in the state employment. So, uh, however, we uh, have been working on this for a while. Um, I, I, if I, anybody has, and I got Margaret ready to go, anybody else has any commentary on what Ms. Jenkins Jones just brought up? I don't disagree with what she's saying, but I do know that we've been uh, working on this, and, and retention wasn't our only issue for this. But uh, Ms. Brown, or um, Margaret Ellen Brown. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. We did that in closed session, thank you. Um, I'm an I'm a individual who loves uh, data, almost too much analysis, paralysis, and so I'd like to little look a little more into Ms. Jenkins Jones' data because I don't like to start from an assumption that we have trouble rec recruiting and retaining uh, managers without having the data that proves that. So I don't know if we have that same data that shows that or if we can do at least a comparison and maybe set this over. I don't have a vote on this committee but uh, maybe set this over until we could take another look at it. I do worry that if most of our uh, management recruitment comes from within, I don't want to be creating a greater disparity between um, the managers and um, the workers. Um, uh, I too was rank and file and got promoted to management and uh, I will tell you my salaries kept going up and up and the workers did not. So not that management doesn't work, um, but I certainly would like to see um, the data before we jump and make huge salary increases or salary and bonus compensation increases if we truly don't have a problem um, that's as, as bad as this, this um, solution suggests. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Rafino. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the data woke me up. I know, uh, right? That's an issue of compaction that uh, I'm very familiar with <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, that said, I don't have a problem giving the investment manager or management whatever we think it's appropriate. I mean, give them all. But the question is, are we, what are we doing about rank and file? Or are we also have a plan to compensate rank and file? Or is there even a policy, and maybe there isn't, that uh, I know it does not exist at the statewide level uh, for state employment in general, but is there a policy that says that there should be uh, the gap between rank and file and management should be no less or no more uh, so I'm not sure if there is and whether that's been considered during your research. Let me, let me try to respond to that. So the, the I, investment officer three series is also incentive eligible and that's tied to the direct manager. So they are receiving up to 15% incentive opportunities today. So that's different than you would find in other departments other than maybe CalSTRS. Um, I, I'm not aware of an exact gap link, you know, between the two um, in terms of we want, want to get 
beyond that, but, but essentially um, they are connected at this point today in terms of incentive opportunity um, and how well they do and tie together in, in the organization. Um, that doesn't address the other investment officers within the organization, um, but that's also uh, addressed through collective bargaining. So I will, yes, yeah. thank you. I was going to say that's uh, addressed in collective bargaining, most of that. So thank you for the ideas, though. <laughs> and let me call on Mr. Slayton. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, we have, uh, um, we have a unique delegated authority for this group because this group drives the, what's the percentage? 68? What's the, what's the current percentage that's from earnings uh, that's provided? 58. Huh? Yeah. 58? 59. 59%. All right, well, let's agree. 59. So that is such an important piece of this entire organization's work. And so the legislature has agreed to give us that delegated authority for that particular group, which is unusual. It's not typical in state service. CalSTRS has it and we, and we have it. So that puts an awesome burden on us to make sure that we have that particular type of workforce that's gonna optimize that 59% and grow that number to be a higher percentage. That's the solution for this organization. So. There are forces at play here that go beyond normal state service. Um, the fact that we have maybe not that large a percentage vacancy does not translate to having the right people in the right places to accomplish the right objective. That's something that we have delegated to our CIO and the staff to make that happen. Our, our job is to make sure that we have a plan here that will optimize that. Now, we may make an error in it and have the compensation be a slight bit too high. I'd rather err on that side than on the downside because the productivity per employee of that management group is outstanding. It, that's where the leverage is for this organization, is with that group of people. So I, I think that, and I believe we talked uh, before in a briefing, the number of, I don't know if we can do this in this particular session, the number of actual people that would be subject to an increase if we were adopted, is that something we can talk about or not? Just the number of, of positions. I, I think the agenda includes, I think there's like 19 potential people that, that are impacted that way. Mr. Okay, Slayton. Who, and, and you've mentioned in the opening remarks that we're going to, uh, there's gonna be a transition of that. This is not gonna be an automatic, suddenly you're making X and now you're gonna make Y. Uh, that there's a transition approach with this, which is appropriate for management to execute. But how many people are we talking about in the total investment group here? 126. Or 126, and there's 19 Bill. who might I'm sorry. I got a whole bunch of people waiting. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Thank you. I, I just to suggest that uh, we can move along and look at the total number and see if we're comfortable with it. All right, Mr. Miller. Uh, just a, a couple comments from the peanut gallery here. Um, I'm not a committee member, but uh, one of the things that may be a little bit of an elephant in the room is we're talking about relatively few really critical management positions. And when we look at this, I think, you know, we, we may be saying to ourselves as an organization, hey, we haven't been able to get the kind of candidate pools ideally we would like to see with our existing structure. But to do that, uh, we think a lot of those candidates um, you know, may not work here or in another government agency or pension fund, but they're out in the broad world and we've got to be able to A, recruit them, B, retain them, and be able to drive their performance. Uh, the, the trick for, for, for me is I've seen in state government how critical our rank and file folks are. They're doing all the day-to-day -day heavy lifting and work, and if they don't see opportunities for upward mobility and career growth, it's a problem. If we create you know, this situation like we have in my experience where 
all the supervisors and managers in um, my field were instantly given a 47% pay raise, and all of a sudden, all the opportunities for promotion were being taken by external candidates who now suddenly were attracted to state government in that field. And it left our career professionals who started and stayed with state government long term feeling like, man, now what looked like a real career path to me looks like I can't compete um, because I chose a state career rather than a private sector career in this career field. So I, I kind of share some of the concerns about we really need to make sure that we don't have other unintended consequences on our career workforce in these fields that are so important to us. Again, I'll remind the, the board that uh, the uh, some of the positions that, that were being discussed are rank and file and are governed by bargaining. And I'm going to go back to a board member and then I'll go back to a non-board, uh, I'm sorry, committee member and a non-committee member. Ad Adria? Well, no, I, I was actually just going back to answer um, Frank's question and actually Doug. Doug didn't know what the difference between investment officer three and associate investment manager was a 28% difference between the top pay range from the investment officer three classification and the associate investment manager. Um, the typical for you, Frank, for CalHR is 10 to 15% is what we keep between rank and file and supervisory. And that is, is that a standard or yeah, a policy? Yeah, that's our standard. That's our standard. That's your standard. That's okay, thank at. you very much. Uh, Ms. Paquin? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Jenkins-Jones for bringing up the, those data points, and you know, hopefully the staff can bring up um, the same information that she requested in December. And I think looking at the two options before ours, we don't have a vote in this committee, but I think that option C with a long-term incentive alignment, be very curious to see how that is constructed. And I think it's important to make sure that everybody's long-term interests are aligned. and. You know, there are bad years in the market, but just like the Wall Street folks don't get their bonuses if the market tanks, I mean, that is part of the long-term alignment because hopefully we're all working at the same team in the same place, and we certainly want to pay people what they're worth, but, you know, that is part of the risk in being in this business, too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Campbell? I don't have to s <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a, just some information that I think would be helpful to share with recruitment data. So we did pull 10 sample recruitments through our AIMS, through our COIO, two of each. Four of those 10 were external hires, two of which have left. Um, we have some rejected offers, offers based on pay. We don't keep those stats, but we do know that offers have been rejected due to our pay. We also have no way of tracking or knowing the number of people that don't apply because of the posted pay ranges. And also we see range uh, and apply thinking that they can, uh, they see the range and apply thinking that they can negotiate to a top of the range is not always the case. So because they're used to doing this in the private industry, they'll ask for more than even what we, what the salary is now. Um, to address the um, question, or at least one of the questions that Ms. Adria Jenkins-Jones had back in December, um, it was around um, the rank role. And there we do have aims through the COIO that have open continuous exams. The rule of three ranks does apply, which is a, a six limited scoring method, and only the top three ranks are reachable. That was one of the questions, I think, Adria, that you had, um, uh, Ms. Jenkins-Jones, that you had. And so I did want to point that out. I also wanted to point out that um, we do believe this change will also help our uh, IL1s, 2s, and 3s because um, we won't lose them to private because they'll stay seeing that they have a, a better future here if they do move into management ranks. So we actually see this as a positive for them as well. And if something can be worked out through bargaining for them, certainly that's something that we would support. I just think that you know, um, what we're here for today is what you guys govern and what we're able um, to provide. And then I should just comment, and some of you may know this, but in May, CalSTRS will be hearing uh, salary data and looking at making changes for their investment management classifications as well. So, and we have been doing this for a couple of years, and um, it is important, and that's why we've been doing it this long, to make sure we get all those questions answered. 
Um, but the, the main goal of today was hopefully to choose from A and C. We thought we had the information to do that, um, but obviously whatever questions that we're not able to answer, anything else that we need to bring back, happy to do it, but I just want to put some of those things out there. And um, just going back to what we talked about in the very beginning, what is our philosophy, what do we think? And this one of these will align with the philosophy that, we, that uh, the board chose. Great. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Thank you. Mr. Jones? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think Ms. Campbell said what I was going to say <laughs> is that uh, a problem was identified some time ago, and we asked uh, consultants and staff to go and bring us information to solve this problem. Um, over the course of the last several months, the information has been provided to, for us to think about how we might go about solving this problem. Uh, they weren't charged with solving all these other problems. Even though it's a problem that we all care dearly about, uh, certainly I do, and I'm sure the other board members and committee members care dearly about it. Yeah, those are my members. But this action can't solve that problem. The problem that we have to deal with is the one that's being presented here, and we can solve this problem. So I would hope that we separate those two and deal with the problem at hand that we charge people to come with solutions about, and let's solve that, and then do whatever we can to support this other problem about the rank and file, because I think we all are concerned about rank and file salaries also. But I would strongly suggest that we solve the problem that, that's in our governance opportunity right now and go and whatever, you know, make suggestions of how we can and, and, and be engaged and help the others. I'll be willing to do that, but I don't think we should hold up this whole process to get to that point. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So I would be happy, Mr. Slayton, to entertain mm -hmm. that motion. Okay. You are. I don't even have to turn your button on. Whatever. Uh, I, I move that uh, we uh, um, select option C as our preferred alternative and that we instruct uh, staff to come back with uh, a um, plan design for the long-term incentive. Um, and I guess the only other piece are we, should I include in the motion, just leave it at that I, or let the ranges? I, leave it at that. Just leave it at that. I, yeah. Why don't we just leave it at that for now? I, that gets us, is that what, that's what you were looking for primarily, right? Does that get us what we need? Yes, but um, by adopting either A or C, we are adopting the ranges. What you're suggesting is the okay. uh, incentive, um, the long-term incentive in the plan design. Okay. For range C, you said, right? For the, for range the C. It, it's adopting the, the C platform with the ranges indicated in C. Correct. All right. Second. That's the motion. Okay, I have a motion on the floor, a second, a motion by Mr. Slayton, a second by Ms. Hollinger. Um, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Okay, all those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, let the record show that Ms. Adria Jenkins Jones is an A, and the motion passes. All right, thank you. Yay, Thanks. we got done with that one. Is that it? <sighs> My whole thing logged off, so now I have to wait. Hold on a sec. I think we are done, but let me check. Okay, that. It's so I think the summary committee direction, I, the feedback we just you just voted on would be uh, the the team here working with your independent consultant to provide provide additional information um, on the long term incentive. Um, we'd bring that back at a future meeting. Could I also request yeah. uh, Ms. Jenkins Jones um, supplied her own numbers, but could you go back and and uh, get with her and make sure that you know. I know you do, but maybe the whole board would like to see it, and I don't want to make you do that. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, providing us so with that. So we could do that and just provide it back to the committee? Yeah, that would be okay. great. Okay. 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 Any other uh, direction? That was it. All right. So uh, thank you very much. I, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. And our committee is adjourned. Risk and audit at 210. Risk and audit at 210.